Good morning, folks. And welcome to Central Lakes College and to Cultural Thursday, our monthly cultural literacy program where we invite and host speakers from around the world to help us better understand the diverse people, perspectives, and places of our planet. My name is Joey Yao. I am the director of the Central Lakes Community Performing Arts Center. <laughs> I'm the most boring person here today, I promise. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm very proud to introduce you all to today's speaker, Phil Hunsaker. Phil Hunsaker's extraordinary life story began with a trip to Japan at the age of three months, igniting a lifelong passion for travel. His adventures have taken him from being a student of marine biology in Florida to a Peace Corps volunteer in Central Africa, a fishery biologist in Alaska, a graduate student in Vermont, and a game park director for the World Wildlife Fund in the African rainforest. He has also worked as a ghostwriter for Minnesota Public Radio, and more recently pursued a career as a part-time bluegrass musician. During his time in the Central African Republic as a Peace Corps volunteer, Hunsaker faced incredible challenges that tested his skills, patience, digestive system, immune system, and sense of humor. Despite the difficulties, he looks back fondly on those years. His mission involved teaching, teaching Central, Af Central Africans how to raise fish in ponds, and later how to protect elephants, gorillas, and the Central African rainforest. While he was officially the teacher, he often found himself the student as he learned invaluable life lessons from the Central African people. The trip profoundly altered his life, and he eventually turned several of his experiences into a novel, which he'll be discussing today. We hope you enjoy today's presentation, and we hope it inspires you to consider your own travels and explorations of our world and cultures in the future. We hope you might also join us again for our next Cultural Thursday event on November 2nd, where we will be presenting Adrian Benjamin from Malax, who is a master jingle dress maker. Adrian will be presenting two shows that day, um, the first at 10 a.m. here in the Charlberg Theater on her experience as a businesswoman and cultural appropriation of indigenous cultures, and then a second presentation at noon where she'll be presenting a, a jingle, uh, a jingle uh, dress dance. Um, so we're really looking forward to those. So we hope to see you again, and thank you, and please welcome Phil. Well, thank you very much. Um, barama. So that means hello in the Central African language of Sango. And when you hear somebody say Barama to you, you respond Baramingi, which means hello a lot. So I'm going to say Barama to you, and you're going to respond Baramingi. Barama. Barama. All right. Um, I know you'll have time to ask me some questions here toward the end of my presentation. But I wanted to start off with a question for you. And I like asking this when I talk about the Central African Republic. Can anyone here tell me anything about the Central African Republic? Except an, an unacceptable answer won't be that Barama means hello in the Central African language. Can anybody tell me anything about the Central African Republic? I see a hand in the back. Yes, there are gorillas there, and it borders on the Congo. It borders on the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which used to be called Zaire. It also borders on the Republic of the Congo, or Brazzaville, uh, to the south. Anybody else have any know anything about the Central African Republic? Gary. Uh, that's where uh, the U.S. dropped off Eritrea and was kidnapped in Jamaica. Oh, really? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That didn't happen while I was there. Anybody else? Here. Yes, it was a French colony. So you guys actually know more than most people when I ask them. I, when I tell people that I lived and worked in the Central African Republic, the usual response I get is, cool, what country were you in? The Central African Republic is a country. And most Americans know very little about the Central African Republic, uh, which is part of the reason why I wrote a novel about the place. Uh, and the novel takes place mostly in Central Africa, the Central African Republic. It bounces around to a few other places, but most of it takes place in the Central African Republic. And to be honest, I knew very little about the Central African Republic when I first went there as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, I went there in 1977 to be a fisheries volunteer to show Central Africans how to raise fish in ponds. Um, I knew it was a former French colony. I knew that it was in the middle of Africa, and I knew that the current corrupt leader when I was going over there was a guy named Bokasa. And Bokasa 
decided that he was Napoleon reincarnated, and so he crowned himself emperor and decided that the Central African Republic would then be called the Central African Empire, um, which it was for several years. I was actually there when he was crowned emperor uh, in 1977, and I was there when he was deposed in a coup d'etat in 1979. Um, those were exciting times. Um, I had a friend named Tom O'Toole. Um, he used to be a, a teacher, a professor down at St. Cloud State University. I met him when he was, he was a Fulbright scholar and he was studying over in the Central African Republic when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And he ended up writing a book about uh, his research that he did over in the Central African Republic. It's called The Central African Republic, The Continent's Hidden Heart. And in his first sentence, of his book, he says, uh, and I'm quoting here, um, he says, no part of Africa has been misunderstood, misrepresented, and mistreated over the years than the area that today constitutes the Central African Republic, end quote. That's the first sentence in his book. And Tom was really right on with his uh, ob observations of, of Central Africa. Um, it was raided by slave traders. Um, it was colonized by the French, who left Central Africans ill-prepared for independence, which they gained in 1960. Um, its own corrupt rulers have continually ripped off the country and neglected the needs of its citizens. It is in the midst of a violent civil war that has pitted Christians against Muslims, and it's been going on for close to 20 years now. Uh, and to make matters worse, it is now under the influence of the Wagner Group, or the Wagner Group, um, which are, is, a, is a mercenary army uh, tied to the Russian military. Uh, um, you may have seen a few weeks ago the leader of the, the Wagner Group, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin, um, recently died in a mysterious plane crash that exploded. Um, some people s suspect that it happened because he had basically started to stage a coup against Vladimir Putin. But his uh, mercenary armies are still out in Africa. And they're there because they try and take advantage of the uh, uh, mineral wealth, gold, diamonds. Um, so they are active in the Central African Republic now. Um, all that said, um, Central Africans are surprisingly able to wake up each morning with a smile. And they treated me with warmth and kindness and hospitality and respect the whole six years I lived there. Um, I'm going to show some slides of some pictures that I took when I was there. And I, I think some are some uh, uh, pictures that some friends of mine took. Uh, and I'll just kind of randomly click through them. Uh, they won't necessarily jive up with what I'm talking about, but I thought that they would give you a good visual image of, of the place and how people live and some of the wildlife that's there. People always want to see wildlife. Um, so I'll, I'll start with this African map here. Um, the Central African Republic, right in the center of the continent. Uh, it's landlocked, which is one of its problems as well. Um, it's bordered to the north by Chad. This is actually an older map. This is from the 1960s. It's a an older relief map that I have hanging in my house. And so some of the country names are not uh, what they are now. Um, but it, it's bordered on the north by Chad, Sudan, and South Sudan. Um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which used to be called Zaire, and the Republic of the Congo uh, are just to the south. Um, Cameroon is just to the west. Um, that's a, a, a better picture of the, the country itself with some of the towns. Um, the Central African Republic is about the size of Texas. Uh, it has a population of about five and a half million. And you compare that with Texas, which is 30 million. Uh, so there's a lot of open space in the Central African Republic. Uh, the area used to be called the Ubangi Shari, uh, named after a couple of rivers that kind of formed boundaries. It was also part of French Equatorial Africa before it became the Central African Republic. Uh, French is the official language. It's a former French colony. Uh, but Sango is the national language. And it's a, it's a language that is spoken from one end of the country to the other. Um, if you've had any kind of education, then you will hear uh, a French being spoken. But most of the time, it's Sango or it's local tribal dialects. 
Um, this Sango is an interesting language. The, when I went there with Peace Corps, they put you through pretty rigorous language training. Um, I had already had French all through school, still got some French training when I was there, but they teach you Sango as well. And I became pretty good at Sango. Um, I really enjoyed it because it's, it's a very simple language to, to make something a future tense, you just add a, a word to the sentence. If you want to make it a past tense, you just add another word to the sentence. Um, also, one word can mean many different things, so you have to kind of know the context of what you're talking about to really pick up what they're trying to get across. For instance, the word fa, F-A, it can mean to cut, it can mean to cross, like to cross a river, it can mean to teach, it can mean to show, it can mean to kill. So you have to pay attention when you're speaking with <laughs> someone in the language of Sango. And Central Africans were very patient with anyone trying to learn their language. They would just get a kick out of, out of an American trying to speak Sango or even some of the local tribal dialects and they were always very patient with you and, and uh, they made it really easy to, to just jump into the language and use it. Um, there are multiple ethnic groups in the Central African Republic, um, including the Baya, the Banda, the Sara, and there are also pygmies who live in the southern part of the country uh, in the rainforest, uh, the, that area that borders along the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the Republic of the Congo. Uh, main cash crops are uh, coffee and cotton, depending on where you are in the country. Southern, it's more coffee. Northern, it, it's more cotton. Um, most Central Africans are subsistence farmers in that they basically grow their own food. Um, they, they grow a lot of uh, cassava or manioc, which is their main food staple. It's a root tuber that they eat pretty much twice a day, every day of their life. Um, they also raise corn and millet and sorghum, uh, peanuts, peppers, and other kind of garden items to, to make their sauces to go with the cassava. Um, they do have mineral wealth with diamonds, gold, uranium, copper. Again, hence the interest by the Wagner Group. They're providing protection for the current president, and in, in, uh, um, in exchange for that, they have gained access to certain mineral rights. Um, so that's where they're making their money. Um, I first went to the CAR as a, a Peace Corps volunteer, um, showing Africans how to raise fish in ponds. Um, there had been a history of this when the French were there. They had started aquaculture throughout the country. It was to get uh, Central Africans to um, get a little more protein in their diets. They could harvest the fish in the ponds. And then uh, if there was extra, they could sell them at the market and make a little money from selling the fish at the market. So we kind of uh, brought to life a lot of the abandoned ponds that had been there during the French colonial period. And it was a very successful project. Uh, we worked with farmers, teaching them uh, how many fish to put in a certain sized pond. Um, they always thought that you know the more fish you put in, the better. But uh, fish need place to need space to to grow and and, and eat and reproduce. And uh, just throwing as many fish in there is not the answer. It's 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 very mathematical as to how many fish you want to put in a certain size pond. Um, they also would uh, would feed the fish. And one we used to raise tilapia. How many here have have bought tilapia at the market? Well, we used to raise tilapia because tilapia are great. They reproduce really quickly, and they'll eat just about anything. They are really hard to kill. They, I've seen them at the surface of the pond sucking oxygen when there was no dissolved oxygen in the water. They just come up to the surface and start breathing oxygen. Um, they will eat just about anything. Um, you can throw banana leaves in there, they'll eat them. You can throw pig manure in there, they'll eat it. You can throw anything, garbage, whatever, they'll eat it, and they grow. Um, I returned, I did Peace Corps, you sign up for two years. I did my two years and liked it so much I stayed a third year. Um, I don't know if I have on the map here. Uh, you can see Bangui there is the capital. And then uh, if you travel like south from Bangui, there's Mbaiki. And if you travel northwest from Mbaiki, that's where I was in a town called Boda. It's not shown on there, it was a small village, but that's where I was as a Peace Corps volunteer. And then when I went back to work with World Wildlife Fund, that was way down in that southwestern corner of the country where it says Zanga Sanga Reserve. That was the game park 
where I worked. It was right there on the border of Cameroon and the Congo. That is actually uh, the market scene in Boda in the morning when people come to the market, sell their wares, buy things, exchange things. Um, so I was there running uh, this Zanga Sanga game park and reserve for World Wildlife Fund, and it was set up to protect elephants, gorillas, bongo, which is a forest antelope, uh, and other forest species, and also bring benefits to the community to show that the community that protecting the wildlife could bring more money into the area than simply wiping it out and having a few meals. Um, just some random observations I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, Central Africans live in simple brick houses, mud brick houses with thatched roofs. Um, uh, hippo there. There's a, an example of a house. Um, very simple. If they've had a good coffee harvest or a cotton harvest, then they would use that money to buy corrugated tin to put on the roof instead, which did a nice job of keeping the rain out. But if it was raining outside and you were inside, it was like living inside a snare drum. Um, most Central Africans live without running water or electricity. Uh, I did too the whole time I was there. No one running water, no electricity. And I found I could do quite well without it. There, sure, there are, you miss hot showers and, and you miss being able to easily wash dishes and just take a shower, but uh, you can't. You go bathe in the, in the river, you um, wash your clothes down at the river. Um, usually you'd hire somebody to do that. Um, in fact, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, we didn't make a lot of money, um, but they gave us enough to where we could actually hire someone to do the daily household chores. So you needed somebody who could cook your meals for you, who could go to the market every day because there's no refrigeration, um, someone who could um, wash your clothes for you, um, someone who could keep the place clean. And so m most Peace Corps volunteers will hire someone to do it. It's, it's I think, Peace Corps thought of it as one way that you can actually sort of bring some of the money that's coming to you and put it back into the community. Um, and w I also did that when I worked for World Wildlife Fund. We hired a, a young guy um, named A. Lee, who uh, was our cook, he was our laundry person, he hauled water for us. And uh, um, it was a, a, a job that a lot of people wanted because it paid pretty well. Um, meals are cooked over an outdoor open fire. Um, manioc is the staple, and it usually comes with a, a spicy sauce to dip the manioc in. Manioc is a root tuber, and it goes through this long process uh, before you eat it. it. It supposedly has, I think, arsenic in the covering of, the, of the, the tuber, and so it's soaked in water to leach out the arsenic, and then it's kind of cut up and pounded up and then dried in the sun. And then after it's dried, it's pounded up again and then sifted to make a flour. And that flour, it, you add hot water to that flour and mix it up. And it looks kind of like a, a bread dough before it's baked. And you sit around and pull off a piece of the, the manioc and you dip it into a sauce. And usually people will gather around the same table. No utensils, no plates. You're just eating from the, the plate where the manioc is sitting and the bowl with the, the hot spicy sauce. And it really depends on how good that sauce is. The manioc is, is filling. It's a carbohydrate. Um, it fills you up. After you've eaten it, you know you've eaten something. It sits right, in, right there in your stomach all day. Um, and I think that's why Africans like it. They used to tell me that it, it wasn't a meal unless they had manioc. You know, you could have some rice. Rice was fine, but you'd get hungry again after rice. So they would have manioc. Um, I ate some weird things when I was there. Uh, it was impolite to turn down food that was offered to you. So we were encouraged to just say yes. Um, uh, I ate live termites, uh, nature's candy. <laughs> uh, they harvest them right when they become winged insects and kind of come out of the termite mounds. And uh, you just eat them live, you just pop them into your mouth and just swallow. Um, caterpillars, they wouldn't eat those live, they would generally smoke them. Um, I think I've got one slide on here somewhere that, where there's a woman who is, is stringing live caterpillars to set to, or, or dead caterpillars that have already been smoked to sell at the market. Um, 
I also ate some of the best fish I've ever had. Uh, Nile perch, which is in the rivers. It grows to be larger than a man. Uh, also a fish called a tiger fish. Uh, amazing, just white fillets, you know, this thick, that uh, just really good tasting. And we'd get people fishing in the rivers and they'd come up to our place and say, hey, I've got a, a big fish, are you guys interested? Um, I also ate some of the best uh, tropical fruits, uh, papayas, mangoes, pineapples, um, just great tropical fruits. Um, working there can be very frustrating, um, especially for foreigners trying to get things done. And things don't get done as quickly as you think they should. Um, for example, a trip to the capital city in Bangui to go pick up some supplies, you would think, oh, this might take me two or three hours. It could take days, just trying to find what you needed. And then you'd meet other people or you'd have something go wrong with your vehicle while you're in there. It just seemed like things just did not get done quickly. And in my book, um, which is called The Old Crocodile Man Theory, uh, a novel of murder, mystery, and monkey business, um, I, I talk about this acronym called CARL, C-A-R-L, where uh, CARL stands for Central Africa Rarely Loses. And I just thought I'd re read you this sh short passage about this description of the, the concept of CARL for those uh, non-Central Africans who are trying to get something accomplished in Central Africa. So CARL was an acronym for Central Africa Rarely Loses. And it was usually uttered with a symbolic shrug of the shoulders and a smile of expected resignation Central Africa lost the lottery when it came to competent, honest leaders, but it always seemed to win big when a foreigner tried to get something accomplished within its borders. It made no sense to argue with the ticket agent at the Bangui airport about being bumped from a flight, even with a confirmed reservation. She wouldn't be swayed since it wasn't confirmed with Carl. It was ludicrous to complain to the police about being constantly hassled at their numerous roadside checkpoints. Carl had put them up, and only Carl could take them down. It was worthless to yell and scream in the bank because orderly lines were ignored by everyone, including the tellers. Carl didn't know about lines. Only those who could push and shove through a growing mob and get close enough to wave a deposit withdrawal slip under the nose of a teller would accomplish any banking business on that day. Smart bankers got behind Carl and followed his blocks like a halfback running off tackle people noticed Carl. He was plopped down on the bench next to all non-Central Africans, rumpled, disheveled, and spewing out his morning breath as the day started with a cup of too sweet coffee and greasy beignets. He was in the outhouse handing out the sandpaper like toilet paper. He was under the mosquito net drooling on the pillow and stealing the covers through another sleepless night. Carl was omnipresent, and those who learned to tolerate his annoying intrusions with a casual shrug of the shoulders and a smile were the ones who left the CAR with fond memories of a beautiful country full of gentle people bearing more than their fair share of life's burdens. So that's kind of a concept that goes throughout my book of, of, of how uh, things just don't go the way you want them to go. Um, I thought let's talk a little bit about the book. I know I want to leave some time for questions. I want to make sure that if there are any students in here, they can get off to their next class. I would hate for you to miss a class. Um, so the book is called The Old Crocodile Man Theory, a novel of murder, mystery, and monkey business. It was published in 2021 by River Place Press. Um, I received an individual artist grant from the Five Wings Arts Council um, to help with some of the promotion and marketing. Um, it is very autobiographical in that it is based on a lot of my own experiences in the CAR, um, but uh, it's, it's also a lot of made up stuff. And I, uh, it's interesting when I talk to people about the book, they always wanna know what's real and what's made up. Um, so crocodile men are sorcerers in the Central African Republic who have the ability to change into crocodiles and to kill people in the rivers. And this is a belief, this is a belief in the CAR, and people are actually in prison for being accused of this crime. So I knew people who were in prison 
for being accused of, of being crocodile men. Um, my story is about a guy named Kale Husker, uh, who finds out that an old friend of his has died in the Central African Republic, and it is reported that she's killed, she was killed by a crocodile man. And Kale decides to venture to the, to the Central African Republic to find out what really happened to his friend. Um, so at its core, it's a, it's a murder mystery um, in that someone has died, someone's trying to figure out what happened. But it's also about a clash of cultures, um, an American trying to get things done in the Central African Republic. Uh, it's also a story about relationships, the relationship that Kale has with the woman who has died, uh, the relationship that Kale has with another woman that he meets uh, through the book. Uh, it's his relationship with uh, the man who was accused of being the crocodile man. Um, it's also about his relationship with a, a group that we call, I call the Three Stooges. Um, the Three Stooges are the three biggest lawbreakers around the park and reserve. Uh, it's the Suprefet, who is kind of like the governor of a state, uh, the mayor, and the police commissioner. And uh, I, I write in the book that, um, that they were described as if there was a dis dishonesty Olympics, they'd sweep the medals in backstabbing, the lying marathon, truth hurdling, and the two-faced bobsled. So these are the kinds of folks that Kale has to deal with in trying to figure out what happened to his friend Molly. Um, I tried to include a lot of humor in the book as well. Um, I, one thing I enjoy doing is, is writing humorous pieces, and I tried to include as much humor. And, and I think when you talk about the CAR, you have to have a sense of humor. Uh, otherwise, you'd go crazy. Um, because things just seem so far out there and so ridiculous. If you didn't have a good sense of humor, you, you'd, you'd go crazy. Um, I thought I'd, I'd read a, a passage, a short passage from the book that gives you a taste of the story, um, the humor, and the characters. Um, so I'll set the stage. Um, so Kale gets out to the Central African Republic, and he he goes there to find out what happened to his friend Molly, but he also goes there because he's gotten a job to work at this game park. Um, so he's out at the game park where he's working, and he is summoned to the office of the Suprefet, and he's told to be there uh, promptly at 8 o'clock the next morning. And so this is a, a little passage from the book. Uh, let me see. Oh, there it is. Kale arrived at the Supre phase right at 8 o'clock. It was a typical government structure, chipped cement over cinder block, painted white with green trim, peeling under a rusting tin roof. No one was home, so Kale sat in the shade of a nearby mango tree. He contemplated how long it would take before his host showed up. Most Central Africans used specific European-style times such as 8 o'clock, as mere approximations. An 8 a.m. meeting could start at 8.30, 9 o'clock, 10.45, or not at all, if the palm wine was flowing and free. And yes, that's me when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, to pass the time, he chatted with passersby. One bent over old woman from a neighboring house approached with a straight backed wooden chair that may have outweighed her. She set it down next to Kale and said that it was much more comfortable than the route he was presently sitting on. He thanked her and said that he was waiting for the Suprefet. She nodded and went back to sweeping up the goat droppings on the small plot of dirt in front of her house. Her brush strokes left a herringbone pattern in the dust. A few minutes later, a child of five or six came out of the same house. She was cradling a tin mug in her small hands. She walked up to Kale. It's coffee. My grandmother sent it over. That's very nice of your grandmother, said Kale, accepting the mug. Tell her I said merci. The girl nodded. And tell her I think her granddaughter is very pretty. The little girl giggled and ran back to her house. Her tiny footprints added gentle touches of imperfection to her grandmother's uniformly swept dirt. Kale sipped his sweet coffee. He was reminded of his friend Molly who used to cynically call this local brew a cup of African politics because all that sugar still couldn't hide the basic bitter taste left behind by the lower grade coffee bean. He poured a little on the ground. I'll give you more if you promise to stay out of my dreams. 
that's a, a thing that Central Africans do uh, often when they have something to drink, they'll pour a little on the ground and that's to appease the spirits, to appease their ancestors. Uh, he looked up to see a man standing in front of the Supreme's office door. He inserted a key into the lock, pushed the door open and kicked a small wedge underneath to keep it from shutting again. Kale glanced down at his wristwatch. It was 8.42 and it appeared that the Supreme's office was now open for business. Kale stood up. He took a few more gulps of coffee before setting the mug on the chair. He walked over to the office's open doorway and poked his head in. Monsieur the Supreme? The man who had unlocked the door sat behind a little desk. He didn't look up, even though he appeared to be doing nothing. He will be here soon. Great, thought Kale. Soon was no doubt in the same category of nonspecific terms as not far and eight o'clock. Kale kept his cool. My name is Kale Husker. I was supposed to have an eight o'clock appointment with the Supreme. The man looked at his watch. You're late. It's 8.43. Kale smiled. I've been waiting since eight. You can take a seat in his office. Kale was escorted into a dark back room. The man opened a window shutter for light. The room wasn't much to look at. All four walls were bare except for the same airbrushed portrait of the current dictator hanging above a desk. There were four chairs in the room. One was behind the desk and three others were lined up to face the front of the desk. The man said, sit anywhere except behind the desk. That's the superface chair. The man departed without comment. There were no magazines to read, so Kale sat, sat quietly in the middle chair. After several minutes, a different man entered the room. This man was taller, thinner, and dressed in a yellow leisure suit. He looked like a ripe banana. He was followed by two shorter gentlemen. One was a muscular guy in a light blue uniform, and the other, the skinnier one, was wearing blue jeans, a long-sleeved Western-style shirt, and a straw cowboy hat. The ensemble wasn't quite complete, however. Flip-flops adorned the skinny cowboy's feet rather than pointy-toed cowboy boots. Kale stood up. His first thought was, was that these had to be three members of the musical group, The Village People. Maybe, like many dying bands, they had to resort to touring in out-of-the-way locales like Central Africa to search out new fans. It was the only logical explanation. The banana said, sit down, Monsieur Hunsaker, or Monsieur Husker. <laughs> the banana sat behind the desk. The two others took their places in the empty chairs at either side of where Kale was sitting. I am Monsieur Wabunda. Now that you are here in Bayanga, I am your superfe. My friends are Monsieur Yakonomingi, your police commissioner, the man in the uniform nodded, and Monsieur Lekeke, your mayor, a tip of the cowboy hat. Kale realized he was in the presence of the three stooges. He reached out and shook each one's hand enthusiastically, starting with the Supreme and ending with the mayor. I'm so pleased to make your acquaintance. I've heard so much about you. I feel as if I already know you. He turned to the Supreme, Monsieur Wabunda, the, the top banana. Thank you for inviting me this morning, and it was nice of you to include your friends. Meeting you all at once like this will save me a considerable amount of work. He looked from the police commissioner to the mayor. Now I won't have to visit your offices to introduce myself. That will leave me with more time to protect the forest. Already we are collaborating. That's more than your predecessor, Monsieur Mitch, ever did, said the police commissioner. The two other stooges nodded in agreement. Kale wanted to be as diplomatic as possible in his response, but defending one asshole to three others was ludicrous, at best. He decided to just stick to the facts. Monsieur Mitch is now working in the Congo. You'll probably never see him again. I, on the other hand, will be very visible at the Dole and Gili Reserve's new, new director, and I promise to be as cooperative as you. The Supreme said, we are very glad to hear that. Why then do you employ a sorcerer who was arrested for the murder of one of your fellow Americans? I'm an equal opportunity employer, said Kale. Hassan has a prison release form signed and stamped by Nola's Prefe and police commissioner. Kale wasn't sure if the Stooges knew yet who had paid Hassan's fine. Why tell them more than he had to? It is my belief that Hassan committed no crime. He is not a crocodile man. He is, however, a very talented mechanic and cook. As far as I can tell, his only fault is that he doesn't like beer. He drinks the blood of his victims instead, said the mayor. Kale wanted to laugh, but the mayor's stony stare suggested he genuinely believed what he had said. 
He was, Kale decided, as serious as one could be while wearing a cowboy outfit with flip-flops. <laughs> with tongue in cheek, Kale said, thank you for the warning, Monsieur the Mayor. The mayor nodded earnestly. Kale watched Police Commissioner Yakono Mingi pull out a single cigarette from his breast pocket. The guy had Popeye-like forearms. His cigarette, however, was bent and flattened. He rolled it on the desktop. Kale assumed that he was attempting to reshape the deformed cylinder before popping it into his mouth. Instead, he rolled it so hard that tobacco burst from its white paper skin. With one meeting hand, he brushed the mess to the floor where it fell at Kale's feet. Kale got the distinct feeling that he was be being sent some sort of subtle message, like, don't joke around with me or I'll roll you across this desk and make the stuffing come out of you just as easily. It probably wasn't the time for a wisecrack, but he couldn't help himself. He smiled at the police commissioner and said, that's one way to prevent cancer. When the commissioner didn't respond, Kale decided to push him even farther. Did I mention that Commissaire Dimasse is a very old and dear friend of mine? The compact muscular body of Bayanga's police commissioner seemed to swell to a point where it tested the constraints of his tailored uniform. Just before buttons would pop and seams would tear, the superfade diffused the situation with a little diversionary ego stroking. Did you know, Monsieur Husker, that Commissioner Yakono Mingi arrived in Bayanga? Since he arrived in Bayanga, the incidence of theft has gone way down. The smart aleck in Kale wanted to say, and poaching has gone way up, but this time he held his tongue. That's great, so I can leave my front door unlocked? He looked right at the police commissioner, who appeared to have regained his composure. It's never wise to tempt fate, Monsieur. You may be one of the unlucky ones. On the contrary, said Kale, with a known crocodile man living under my roof, my house is probably the last place a thief would invade. The superfait leaned across his desk. May I remind you that this is not your house. It belongs to my government. Only until the next logging company arrives, and that could be soon, said the mayor. The word soon eased any worries Kale might have had about being evicted from his house. This town needs logging, continued the mayor. There are a lot of trees and a lot of able men without jobs. He pushed his hat higher up on his forehead. Then he leaned forward to rest his elbows on his knees. I worked for the Yugoslavs myself, you know. I was a roll taker. What's a roll taker, asked Kale. He'd never heard that logging term before. I took roll. I called out the names of workers on a list to see if they were present. If they were, I put a check mark next to their name. I got the job because I could read and write and I had a loud voice. What do you do the rest of the day after the roll was done, asked Kale. We had many people working different shifts. My job took all day. Kale wasn't surprised. From what he had learned, the logging company had employed anyone who could breathe. They didn't even have to breathe very well. The story on the mayor was that after logging operations had folded, he had been elected in a landslide victory by promising the return of logging to the region. He had even convinced the voters that they should finance a campaign to lure another logging company to Bayanga. Taxes were raised, Bayangans didn't complain because they believed that their collective future depended on the forest sounds of chainsaws and someone yelling timber. Logging had yet to return to Bayanga, but the mayor somehow ended up with a brand new red Suzuki motorcycle. Even more discouraging to Kale was that several years later, the mayor was reelected in another landslide. The little guy under the cowboy hat had to be one sugary sweet coffee bean. In the land of Carl, most believed that despicable behavior by an elected official was an accepted perk of the position. An honest politician was not only an oxymoron, he was a moron. He was surrounded by so much corruption that if he didn't take advantage of certain situations, Someone else surely would, and someone else's family would eat better than his own. Therefore, Mayor Lekeke had only done what any mayor in the land of Carl would do. Um, so I have, some sign, I have some books, and I can sign them if you'd like. Um, I charge $20 for the book. It's actually, with sales tax, it's about 18 But what I tell people is that... Um, if you t give me a 20 and tell me to keep the change, then that extra money goes to support a couple of organizations still doing good work over in the Central African Republic. One is called Water for Good, and they dig and maintain water wells that supply clean drinking water for whole villages. And the other group is World Wildlife Fund, who I used to work with over there, and they're still active down in that southwestern part of the country protecting elephants, gorillas, bongo, and other forest wildlife. Um, 
Uh, just so you know, I have never had anyone ask me for their change back. Um, let's see if we can keep that streak going. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I've left some time uh, to take some questions. I know we've got uh, some microphones uh, that can be passed around if you want everybody to hear your question. Um, but uh, you know, let's hear what you have to say. Got a microphone coming right to you here in the front. My question is, is like, how how do you know, like, for like elephants that get killed like that, why do they do it? So, why do elephants get killed? Well, they're after the ivory. Uh, a lot of times, we'll find dead elephants in the forest, and the only thing wrong is that they've got a bullet to the head, and their ivory is gone. Uh, ivory is worth a lot. There are still countries that uh, will um, market in ivory. Um, China still has an active uh, um, ivory trade. Um, there are some countries in Africa, in Southern Africa, they manage their elephant herds like we manage our deer herds here in, in Minnesota. And they believe that since they're able to manage their elephant herds, they should be able to harvest elephants from time to time and sell the ivory. The problem is that, that still creates a market for ivory. So there are a lot of folks who, who think that we shouldn't have any kind of hunting of elephants at all. It's really sad when you see them. I mean, they're amazing creatures. Um, I know I've got some pictures here um, of some elephants. That's a typical meal scene where they're sitting around an open fire and uh, uh, cooking meals there. Most everything is done outside of a house. People sleep in their house, but they don't sit around in their house, they don't have TVs, so they don't watch TV in their house. Um, they don't entertain in their house. What they do is they pull chairs outside and you basically sit outside. Um, it, of course, you don't do that if it's raining, but generally everything is done outside and not inside the house. There's some elephants at a clearing. We had this clearing uh, in the forest and the elephants like to come in there. They socialize, they like to uh, eat the dirt, which is rich in salt. Um, it's, it's fun. We had a big observation tower there that you could, you could watch the different animals come in and out and they were protected. So, any other questions? See, Ann has one. Phil, I'm wondering if your sense of humor that you kind of described that your main character having in your book, if, if it was, there was a clash of understanding um, when you tried to speak with, with people there. Um, somewhat, uh, I mean, Central Africans have a great sense of humor too. They can't joke about their rulers. Um, we were told when we were Peace Corps volunteers not to get into discussions with Central Africans about who was the current ruler of the country. They, you know, word gets around and if, uh, if if someone hears that someone has, has been critical of the ruler, even in, the, in a joke, then that they might get some retribution for that. So we, you know, there were certain topics that were kind of uh, um, untouched when we were joking around with people. Um, it, as Peace Corps volunteers, whenever we got together and talked, instead of mentioning Bokasa's name, we always said Bozo. Bozo was our, our uh, cue word for talking about the current ruler. Um, but I mean, you know, it's funny. I mean, Central Africans have, have a, a great attitude about most everything. Um, um, they are rare. They rarely get upset over things. Um, I hardly ever saw people get mad. Only when they were drunk, only when they were drinking too much, would I see people get angry. Otherwise, I just, I just never did. They were always very kind of even keeled. Um, enjoyed having a good time, um, enjoyed being around other people. That's one of the things I noticed when I was in the Central African Republic is that very few things are done individually. Um, there really is no privacy. These houses that they live in, they're just basically one big room. Um, uh, that they couldn't quite understand Americans and our need to have our own space to just kind of get away and be on our own. They didn't quite understand that because they're always surrounded by family. Any other questions? Yeah, Heidi. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I have two kind of. Um, one is you said that there were a lot of um, slave uh, people who were brought uh, or captured as and then ens uh, enslaved here or I suppose other places in the West. I'm wondering if there are any words that have come down from that area, Sangha or or other dialectical sorts of uh, words that have come down. And then the other question was, when's the last time you were there? Um, explain the, the, the slavery question again. You wondering about what? Words that have come down? Yeah, like words that are part of our vernacular that are uh, that Americans use, or U.S. citizen, or people who live in the U.S. now. Uh, if there are any words that have come from that part of Africa. Hmm. I don't know. I'll look at my wife to see. My wife is here. She was she was there the two years we were we were both working for Rural Wildlife Fund. Does anything come out? Um, I, I I know some people I've talked to about the the language of Sango and um, um, I have some friends who have done work over in East Africa and Tanzania and Kenya, and where they speak speak Swahili and we have found words from the Central African language of Sango that are the same in Swahili. The word for animal is nyama in, in both languages. The word mingi, like when I said barama, you say bara mingi. Mingi means a lot. Um, those words somehow made it from either Swahili to, you know, to Sango or Sango to Swahili. I'm not sure which way they traveled, but, but they're common. I don't know of any others that have come to um, uh, the states that are part of the vernacular. Um, the last time I was there, um, I was training Peace Corps volunteers in Gabon, uh, which is uh, southwest of the Central African Republic on the coast, a very oil-rich country, um, teaching environmental volunteers there. And uh, I had the opportunity to go back up to the Central African Republic and visit, and I went back, and that was in 2000. So it's been 23 years since I've been there. It's not because I don't want to go, it's because the country is really in turmoil right now. Um, there, a lot of people have been killed. Um, it's not a safe place to be. Um, uh, hopefully one day they'll get things figured out and I can make a trip back over there. I still get newsletters from the, the park and reserve. That's still doing very well. It's amazing some of the stuff that they've accomplished there. They're now habituating gorillas where you can go out and kind of sit amongst groups of, these are Western lowland gorillas, not the mountain gorillas. These are the gorillas that you usually see in zoos here in the States. But the, there was no habituation of, zoo, of gorillas when I was there, and they've gotten to the point where they're now habituating them. The elephants are fairly protected. Um, it's, they're doing some great things. They, they've gone high tech with a lot of their anti-poaching stuff. Uh, having uh, um, uh, cameras out in the woods and using satellite GPS stuff and sending poaching patrols out. So it's, uh, it's really gone um, high tech. Yeah, question right here. Did you ever feel... Got a microphone over there? Uh, Go ahead. So the question was, did I ever feel unsafe when I was there? And, and really, I didn't. Um, there were certain areas in the capital city of Bangui. There was a, um, a place called um, Kilomet Sank. Kilomet Sank is five kilometers. So it was five kilometers from the center of town. Um, and it was a place where there were lots of bars and markets. And, and a lot of the Central Africans would kind of hang out there just bustling. Um, we were often told to be careful when we were there. It wasn't necessarily because of violence. It was more for like pickpockets and, you know, you might get ripped off while you're there. But I didn't really ever hear of anyone getting physically assaulted or beaten up. Or, and then now we're to the point where there are a lot of people around the country in these uh, uh, rebel groups that are carrying guns and killing. And it's just become... A mess. It's not the same place that it was when I was there as a Peace Corps volunteer in 1977, or when I went back with World Wildlife in 1990, or even when I was there in 2000. It's not the same place. Yes. You mentioned our work with the pygmies. Do you want to expand on that a little bit about what some of the issues are for the pygmies and, and how they're surviving in this situation? 
There's Denise and me and our son Josh uh, in one of the observation towers uh, looking down on elephants. We spent a night uh, there in the tower and just watched animals come in and out of the, uh, of the clearing. Um, pygmies. So um, there are groups of pygmies who are there. Um, they were being studied. Um, they, are, they are not really part of typical Central African society. In fact, Central Africans generally look down on the pygmies because they still live in the forest and, and they don't have jobs and they're very traditional. Um, they have come in toward where the villages are because they found that they can make some money um, working for logging companies. Uh, with World Wildlife Fund, we hired some as trackers to help us find gorilla groups to help us find elephants, to help us navigate through the forest because they are completely at home in the forest. They're completely self-sufficient in the forest. Um, World Wildlife Fund also started a uh, healthcare program to um, um, take on some of the uh, illnesses that pygmies get and they aren't really dealt with in the Central African health system. Central African health system is not great, but they kind of exclude the pygmies from participating in it. Um, one thing they get is uh, these things called chicos um, that I think they're moved around by a lot of pigs and they're kind of in sandy soil and then they get in your, in your foot. They're, they're more serious than chiggers but they get into your foot and they kind of burrow into your foot and you just get all these blisters. Uh, it's like a little worm that's in there sort of eating away at your flesh. Um, and we, World Wildlife Fund, we had some health people and they discovered this local concoction that they could, people could soak their feet into this concoction and it would kill the, the, the chigos that had gotten into the feet. I saw pygmies with chigos so bad they couldn't walk on their feet anymore and they were walking on their knees and they had chigos in their knees. Um, so that was just kind of how the world was there anything else you wanted to add to that Denise well, just the fact that they're now living more around the villages and so because of that they um, they're having a lot of the same issues that other indigenous peoples have had in other yeah countries. alcohol has become an issue um, you know, they make a little money from working with the logging company to show them where the big trees are and how to get there. Um, and then they get paid and they go into town and they use it to buy alcohol and get drunk and then the money's gone and... Yeah, in the middle. Yeah, good question. It depends on who you ask. Um, Every Central African that I ever met believed in animism and that there are spirits, spirit world, crocodile man, there are other spirits that can do other things, good and bad. Um, so there are uh, uh, missionary groups there. Um, there are Catholic missions throughout the country, uh, usually run by uh, the Italians or the French. Um, there are some missions there of uh, American missionaries. There was uh, an American Baptist mission there, and there was also a group called the Grace Brethren. It seemed like the, a lot of them were out of Indiana. Um, if you talk to them, you know, they see Africans coming to church and, and reading the Bible and doing that, and they'll say, well, you know, they're Christians. Well, okay, they're coming to church and, then, and you're talking to them about the Bible, but are they really Christians? They still believe in animism and spirits and black magic. So. You know, there are, are, are some Muslims there too, but uh, the Civil War really turned into a Christians versus Muslims thing. And I've heard a lot of Muslims, which were a very small minority of people who were there, that a lot of them have left the country because of the Civil War that was happening. Yeah, all the way in the back. I, I th anytime you spend time in another culture, there is going to be that culture shock, and why are things going the way that they go for me back home? Right. Um, but I'm just kind of curious, was this character always negative? Was Carl always kind of seeing a negative, and the more time you spent there, was it just kind of an accepted family member? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Carl was a feeling that everyone I knew who was not from Central Africa 
that went there to work, it was a feeling that there was something always against you when you were trying to get things done. CARL was a thing that I made up for the book, the acronym CARL. Um, I, I based it on an acronym that I had heard when I was in Africa, and they called it WAWA, W-A-W-A. And it was, it was for West Africa wins again. So if, if you tried to do something and you couldn't do it, you say, I've been wawa -ed. West Africa wins again. I, I wanted to come up with something specific to Central Africa and just to describe a lot of the frustrations that, that foreigners feel when they're there trying to get things done. And so I kind of took CAR, which is Central African Republic, and I just added an L to it and came up with that acronym, Central Africa Rarely Loses. Um, but it is, a lot of it is corruption, a lot of it is lack of education, a lot of it is lack of opportunities for people to do things. But we, my, my wife and I would joke that we, when you would go someplace, like to the bank, and you would try and get someone to help you in the bank, here, generally, if you've reached a certain level to deal with the public, you show how powerful you are by how much you can help them navigate the system. Um, there, it was, it was just the opposite. You show how powerful you are by putting up roadblocks um, so that you can't navigate the system. And I don't know if that's left over from French colonial period or if that has something that has just developed through Central Africans trying to rule themselves and not being able to do a very good job of it because they weren't properly trained to do it. Um, but it is a pervasive kind of attitude that you're gonna bump your head against, against walls trying to get things done. So you have to kind of really celebrate your victories when they come along. Um, Joey? Okay, one more question. I see uh, Mike here in the front. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, I was struck by your introductory comment about uh, the Peace Corps utilizing sort of the neglected pond infrastructure of the French. and I. It made me wonder uh, how durable are these these well-intentioned programs that are brought from the outside, and and how durable are they? Can you do you, yeah. do you have a sense of that? Particularly now, what forty-five years later, your your work, for example. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's something we wrestled with the whole time we were there. We were we were bringing back this infrastructure that had been done with the French back in the thirties and forties and fifties, and then we were we were trying to pull in Central Africans to kind of take over the program once Peace Corps left. I think that was the, the, the general modus operandi of Peace Corps. You go in, you teach people how to do things, and hopefully when you leave, they're able to do those things themselves. We had some success with that. We were able to hire extension agents to go out and work with the farmers, so it wasn't just our face that had to be in front of the farmers to work with them. Um, but we also had money to pay those extension agents. And then when we left, we had set it up so that there would still be some funding to pay them for like the next several years. But after that, it was going to be up to the Central African government to pay them. And many of them went unpaid. Some of them still did it just because it was a, they got to be known as a person with a, a, a good bit of knowledge about ponds. And if somebody wanted to do a pond, I'll go talk with Jean. He, he knows what he's doing when he talks talk about ponds. So it, it, the infrastructure is not, is not there. Um, to make sure some of these things just keep going. Um, same thing with uh, tourism. Beautiful wildlife that you can see throughout the country. Um, um, but to get there is really expensive. Uh, and then to navigate your way once you get there to where the parks are is, is really difficult. So it's only for the hardiest of, of travelers who want to get there. They'll see amazing things when they're there. Um, but it, again, it's a dangerous place. But it's the infrastructure is not set up. World Wildlife Fund has done what they could a lot. Now there seems like they're bringing tourist groups in from Cameroon instead of in from the capital of Bangui. You fly into Cameroon, and then they fly small planes over into the reserve. I think that's it. Um, Thanks for being here. I just, I, just, my last point I wanted to say is that if you ever have the opportunity, I, I, I really did this for the students, but there's more than just students here, but if you ever have the opportunity to live, work, or study in a different country, do it. Um, yes, it will be challenging, but it will also be rewarding. My wife and I, we both started working overseas when we were young, and it, both of us agree that it, 
it was a defining moment in our lives. Um, there will be days when you want to hop that first flight leaving town, um, but don't give in to your worst impulses. If you stick it out and even embrace the differences, you will be a better person for it. Um, because I lived in the Central African Republic, um, I am more patient, I am more understanding, I am more forgiving, I am more accepting of differences, I'm smarter, and I'm more compassionate. And I think those qualities, I think we need to see more of those in Americans these days. And I think you can get those qualities by going somewhere else and seeing how other people live and realizing how good we have things here and that um, we need to do what we can to make sure it's still good. Um, so thank you very much. Appreciate you guys being here. If, you, if you'd like to, to buy a book, um, I've got some up front here. I can sign them. I'll take checks or cash. Uh, I don't do the Venmo thing. I, you know, I'm in my 60s. I'm not hooked up to all that technology stuff. Um, but I do take cash or, or, uh, or, or checks.